yeah thanks everybody for joining um we we didn't really prepare too much for this we wanted to just make it a kind of an open conversation around atlas and things uh right i don't know if, you, if there was a place you wanted to start but i guess i guess for me one of the things i did want to bring up here is the um the atlas work group so the atlas work group's been on a extended hiatus is probably a, one way to put it uh we are planning to reestablish that working group in the near future, probably by the end of the month, just need to look at schedules and scheduling around it. With the eye towards making it more of a strategic working group, thinking about not only the platform, but the broader Odyssey ecosystem and where Atlas ties into all of that. The kind of previous incarnation of that work group was more, I'd say, tactically focused, looking at specific GitHub issues and making sure that we had places to facilitate some of that discussion. So um you should see some communications around that coming from me in the next uh, week or two just as i get that a little more squared away but everybody is quiet so anthony maybe we can do a quick introduction so that people know who you are who i am who chris is sure uh, yeah um so i'm i'm anthony senna for those that don't know um part of the jansen r d team and um, help to build some of the open source tools in the community. And I'm Greg Labonov. I'm the CTO for IDC's data services. So we've been working with uh, the, the team from Jensen, uh, specifically with Anthony and Chris here as well, on Atlas uh, uh, project for a few years now altogether. So uh, and we're here to answer all your questions. Chris, maybe you can do an intro as well. Uh, also with Jansen, uh, work with Anthony. Been uh, engaged in development with Atlas since the beginning, back in I guess 2015 at this point, 2014 maybe. And uh, yep, welcome to, uh, to entertain questions and give people any information I have that would be useful. Uh, so I have a question. My name is Paul Naji. I'm a faculty member at Johns Hopkins. I, I, I love Atlas. It's such a powerful tool. We have an um, initiative at Hopkins where we actually have 26 different centers of excellence, which are basically clinical registries internally. And I'd like to deploy each of them their own instance of Atlas. And I'm wondering, is there a plan or a way or instructions on how to use Kubernetes or containerizing Atlas so I can deploy it as a relatively stateless for those different registries? Yep. So, uh, my, so there are different ways you can uh, approach your deployment. And of course, it all depends on the platform that you guys uh, are utilizing as well. So in general, I would say we, we're big fans of uh, Docker, Dockerization. Mm -hmm. So we use Docker with Odysseus. I know uh, Lee Evans, uh, you know, build a fantastic image called Broadsea that you can also consider utilizing. It's available at uh, Odyssey GitHub. Uh, so different ways to deploy, and we've been experimenting with uh, more kind of elastic platform-like deployments, the, the one you, you're probably mentioning. Uh, which platform, by, by the way, are you guys targeting? So we're using Azure and uh, Kubernetes services. Okay, yeah. So we've deployed Atlas successfully in Azure and GCP, Google Cloud Platform. Amazon, we've been uh, experimenting quite a bit uh, in terms of uh, um, elastic bins and elastic architecture and deployment. So yeah, so there are different ways, but again, they'll support in common Docker as, as a way to distribute. And, and Docker also has a number of advantages as well as far as uh, uh, not not just the deployment, but the way you update Docker, the way you can back up uh, you know, infrastructure and, and so on. Right, and so you have a preferred Docker image for this uh, that that um, on GitHub. Um, well, that's a good place to start. Again, to answer your question, probably would need to be a bit more involved, uh, kind of discussion focusing on your specific architecture and in, yeah. in, in your. I mean, it's it's flexible in terms of deployment, so you, you can you can choose uh, different models. That's what I would say. Well, right now I can use one Atlas instance, and I can point it to multiple data sources, but then. Mm -hmm all of the users really will share the same cohort definitions. And so right. I kind of, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that, but I need to kind of hide the cohort definitions for each right. clinical registry. Is there a way of doing that within Atlas? S no. So Atlas, yeah. Not right. it's, it's, it's kind of like 
shared amongst the users within a given instance. So you could potentially lock it down with security so that people could see but not touch. But the yeah, there's different roles I can do with an atlas. But if they're IRB, uh, I also want to save their their cohort definitions and data characterizations are going to be something I want to tie to just to that one IRB. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, you you do want to consider multiple instances, of course. It doesn't have a concept of tenants. I think that that's what yeah. you're looking for at this point. It doesn't have it. Uh, so while you can secure people's access to features and data sources uh, through uh, the, the use of groups, but it doesn't have a notion of a tenant. So if yeah. let's say if you do want to have physical separation of designs between different teams, you, you want to have separate uh, instances. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, th this is Arthur Goldberg at, at Mount Sinai. I, I don't have my video on. Uh, we're going to be uh, playing with the Broad Sea uh, Docker images in the next couple of weeks and testing them out. I also put links to uh, Broad, Broad Sea in our chat session. Thanks for that, Arthur. Yeah, I do. We have those trying to see if he was on in the room with us here because he's uh, managing the Odyssey infrastructure and he's using Broad Sea for the Odyssey infrastructure in particular. So uh, he's certainly more knowledgeable than I am about about that platform. We're we are uh, I think limited in what we can deploy with Docker internally at Janssen. So it hasn't afforded us the ability to learn more about that platform. Uh, just one quick question. Um, the gentleman from Johns Hopkins, what was your name? I might want to contact you, please. Yeah. Hi, Arthur. Yeah, I'm Paul Nagy. It's very nice to meet you. Thanks, Paul. Well. Any other questions before I, I we could dive into many topics, but just wanted to give people an opportunity to ask any questions they might have. Don't hey, Anthony. The, oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, my name is Yume. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yes, uh, I work with MG and we just started to use Atlas. So I just want to use this opportunity to learn from you. So only results I have now is some YouTube video I have searched from website. So if you can share other results, we can uh, learn um, Atlas more faster or some tricks will be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we'll say that. So there's the YouTube videos that are linked off of the Atlas GitHub uh, wiki page. But there's also the Eden Academy that has uh, some modules on Atlas itself, which may be useful for learning more about how to use the tool if you haven't already seen those. Yeah, I have seen that. You have seen those, okay. So I'd say those are our main learning resources at the moment amongst uh, maybe some of the other tutorials that have been offered in the past at different Odyssey events, such as the symposium. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. It looks like you Timothy see Quinn is, yeah, is raising a hand. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, <laughs> stepping on your other uh, questioner there uh, earlier. Uh, my name is Tim Quinn. I am uh, one of Arthur's colleagues here at Mount Sinai in New York. And I have uh, maybe a specific question. I remember uh, in response to a previous question, Greg said that Atlas is currently, doesn't have the concept of uh, sort of a multi-tenant uh, type of user login approach. Uh, it is something that we wish we had in the tool, and maybe that points to sort of a more general question about how uh, the Atlas development team goes about prioritizing feature requests. Uh, and maybe this is a topic for the, the Atlas work group that needs to be reestablished in order to have those uh, conversations and, and product roadmap uh, discussions. Yeah, it, it's certainly something that needs to be described and discussed at the Atlas work group. But I know, Chris, um, did you want to say a few words about that? Because we talked a little bit about that. In the right. Past. So that's a common question. Um, things, everything that goes into Atlas should begin with a GitHub issue, whether it's a bug bug report or an actual enhancement request. Um, with the Git, I know it's called a Git issue, but you know you can think of it as just a feature request as well. And in that, you can 
post screenshots, mock-ups, um, discussions of like what the feature, what you, what the need is. Um, people who who troll these uh, boards, as in patrol, not troll, um, can uh, like they'll they'll chime in with or or they'll chime in with their own perspectives on on what that feature should perform. And uh, but basically, that's how I would present it. And if it gets a, some level of activity where there is discussions around it, the work group is the place to kind of like help shape what the roadmap looks like. And then the, what goes into a roadmap is basically what's prioritized. Um, to give an example of this, there was a future request to introduce cohort sampling, which um, was uh, brought in by an external group. And they um, they actually presented an entire pull request near the end of our 2.8 release cycle, so we couldn't get all of the feature in, but we did we did introduce the notion of a cohort sample that makes it easy to navigate to our patient profile viewer. Um, but in in 2.9, the um, they are planning on delivering an entire revamp of our profile view as well as a sort of survey framework that lets you annotate patients within a sample. So there's a whole whole thing about that and there's a github issue um, that is describing that particular feature so hopefully that makes sense but everything starts with the the, the git issue and then proceeds from there into a full-blown pull request that becomes a new feature in atlas and maybe just to add to what chris said um, it's an important point is that not everything has to be delivered as a part of that internal core team atlas team that we you see in here right now as, as a matter of fact a lot of features they come from external contributions. They're delivered and funded by external uh, uh, institutions, organizations, and then being brought into into Odyssey as a as a contribution. But what Chris described is an absolutely fantastic way of at least capturing requirements and making sure that whatever you know contributions are being sent to um, back to Odyssey, they're aligned with uh, an overall roadmap and overall vision of it well as well. Yeah, I think one of the important aspects of getting it up on GitHub, it allows others to not only view it, but to comment and to improve upon the idea. So mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the multi tendency, if we wanted to drill into that for a moment, I think that's that's going to be quite an interesting item to discuss. And it'd be great to get other views on how that would uh, both improve the usability for people that want to use Atlas, but then it also gives us an opportunity to provide feedback on the technical implications of you know, trying to trying to fold that into the platform at this point. Yeah, thanks for those responses. Um, like uh, Paul has at uh, Johns Hopkins, we do have certain use cases where we have certain research teams that want, or it would be appropriate to have a dedicated instance of Atlas for just their uh, sort of slice, their patient cohort slice of our OMOP data model. But we have other use cases where we are standing up a de-identified version uh, of our OMOP instance. And we want to make that broadly available to our research community here within our School of Medicine. There could be hundreds of researchers logging into the tool. And so we don't want them stepping on each other when they create cohort definitions and so forth. So this idea of having a multi-tenant approach uh, to user access permissions and so forth would be very uh, helpful. And even in current Atlas, I mean, uh, the, the problem is um, quite familiar, I guess, to many of us. Uh, the, the I've seen organizations coming up with uh, best practices, essentially, where they tagging uh, their artifacts with a certain in a certain way so that people can understand where it came from, what team, what person, and who modified it last some introduced some kind of level of versioning. So again, if if the if the concern is to make sure that there is a traceability and a clear way of kind of separating teams and artifacts, you can do that. However, if you concern was clearly hiding uh, or preventing rather certain people accessing certain artifacts, then of course the solution would not work as well. And I think there, there are some other things that we've been discussing quite a lot in terms of versioning of artifacts and so as I said, traceability is a big deal, like who changed what and when. So those things are constantly being brought up and it's all valid uh, concern, all valid uh, ideas. I, I This is Arthur Goldberg from Sinai again. I understand the uh, desire to have um, 
everybody be able to view um, proposals through issues and comments and have that be a fully shared uh, interaction. Is it also possible to present um, very preliminary ideas in the forums that uh, the, the um, work group, I think, is the term that, that you're going to be organizing in the future? Because sometimes it's good to get, you know, uh, real-time discussion about preliminary ideas before you want to put something down in writing uh, in an issue. Totally. I think going to the forums and having that discussion there, or at least collaborating and organizing um, your own, like if you want to find people who are interested in that topic and do it independently. I'm a big advocate of independent, uh, like people working independently on this up to a certain point, so that when it comes to how do we get this into Atlas, it's more of a fleshed out idea and not so much a uh, something that has some churn. So any pre-churn that can actually do a little bit of um, uh, pre-work to get that idea into a more concrete thing is probably preferable. So I would suggest maybe if you want to discuss it on the forums, that's totally fair game. Um, it's just that when it finally gets to GitHub, it's like, this is the feature, there's functional requirements, you know what I mean? Like, it's more of a, like the, the core idea and then open to some modification if people have feedback about it. And, and now that you've established what the functions are, you might want to like have a little bit more technical detail. So GitHub is definitely more technical than I'd say, like just open discussion about some ideas and thoughts. Thanks, Chris. Right. Yep. Yeah, I'll just add to Chris's comment there the in the past one of the things that we tried to do with github is to tag some of the issues that we would bring up for discussion on the work group so if things weren't fully flushed out or there was just so much back and forth over an issue we tried to tag it that way to add it to the agenda and allow for discussion there so um, we want to reestablish that work group so that we can kind of continue those sorts of tactical conversations when they're necessary but then also keep an eye towards more of the strategic uh, objectives for the platform. Yes. Uh, Anthony, the good point that you make here, strategic um, for the platform, um, is that that am, is it, <clears throat> am I just not knowing where to look or is it actually not that well described or trans made transparent of what strategic direction is and what gets done and what order and do we dig deeper first, you know, improve certain pieces or do we add functionality? Is this something that where, where, that you routinely interact with the community with? No, that's actually been something that's fallen off a bit, right? So we've had a lot of this happening asynchronously through GitHub and and elsewhere that that hasn't been as transparent as we might like. That's something we need to improve on for this year for sure. Um, I think one of the big things from last year and really want to just give a big thanks and shout out to Chris and the team at Odysseus for getting the 2.8 version out the door because that was languishing away because of some of the lack of communication and things. So I think one of the one of the things that we're trying to do uh, just amongst the small group is to say like we need to have set uh, releases of patches and smaller versions so that things are not languishing away like they did in the past and then using the working group as an opportunity to start thinking about some of the more strategic opportunities there in particular how do we how do we align the tool sets that we're using so that we're not um, potentially duplicating stuff that's being done in the Hades ecosystem and making interoperability between those possible um, you know I know Greg and his team are doing a lot of work around Arachne we want to make sure that we're coordinating there so there's there's still a lot of strategic discussion that still needs to happen, and that needs to be done in an open way, and that's why we want to reestablish that work group to do that. Yeah, and as Anthony said, maybe I'll, uh, I think we also realized that a lot of uh, cross working group uh, dependencies that exist, and he mentioned one of them is Hades, but there's another one that you're very familiar with is OMAP CDM, and specifically the version six uh, saga that we need to figure out, I guess. And so it's, it's probably, uh, an important point that you raising, uh, Christian, and we, we need to start interacting across multiple working groups, aligning our roadmaps, uh, like when does CDM version 6.1 or 7, uh, and I know Claire has been doing a great job in this, uh, she announced that will be released so that we can start aligning essentially what does it mean for Atlas. Hey, it's the same way we've been having uh, fantastic conversations with uh, Martin and 
Hades working group and in terms of their release cycle, their release schedule, what's coming when. So it's important that we start acting as kind of uh, not not a single roadmap, but rather roadmaps that are aligned to each other. I mean, the, the roadmap, so the roadmap always sounds like, you know, you guys haven't done your job kind of thing. There's actually another piece um, which is more important and it's not so like, like guilt driven or anything like this. It is um, nobody actually knows the kind of things that you do and the achievements. So I know that Chris has probably built a lot uh, of the definition of the cohort builder. Okay. Be why? Because that's if somebody has a question, he, he's going to you know answer you know any time uh, uh, of the day or night. So probably he did this. Is this obvious? It's not obvious at all. I don't know what what you know what you did, Anthony. I don't know what what Greg or any any of his gangs gang members did there. Um, we actually need to applaud people and like highlight them in the community um, and not just like oh you you, you haven't, still haven't fixed that bug yet. So that's that's actually one. Uh, it's it's a it's actually an important piece also from a uh, from an. Um, uh, perspective of uh, uh, you know engagement of the community and for other people who are maybe outside right now of the group uh, also thinking of joining because then it becomes much more concrete aha there's a guy he just does this and then it turns into into atlas and it's there and it's cool that's one and then the other one is which i'm kind of like observing from the side um, is um, usually tools of that complexity get done by commercial uh, uh, entities, right? Like 99.99 percent. These are companies. They sell. They have like a real. Uh, they have real staff and real organization, and structure and and training of the people and putting them all in the same systems and 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 uh, and we don't have that and we can't do that and we're like a you know, like a like a motley crew uh, volunteer army. Uh, cobbled together from different organizations who are sitting on different systems and, and the whole thing with the, with the testing. Um, I was wondering whether we should invite like people from um, uh, from the Apache Foundation or Linux Foundation because they have the same problem and they solved it. How do they do that? They they do that, right? Not every of their project is, is fantastic and beautiful and is, is like the Apache server, um, but the a lot of them fail and go nowhere, um, but they have tons of in um, uh, tons of uh, experience of how you do that uh, and how you uh, and how, how you manage that and how you keep people engaged and 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 still have and build the necessary methods of uh, um, uh, being re of responsibilities right and accountabilities. Uh, Christian, I just posted a link to the Apache Superset roadmap, and they have a process exactly like you're talking about, where the community can suggest things, and then uh, it's been discussed, prioritized, and committed by some people, not always the same people, but also people in the community, and then they move it forward in the roadmap. So I'm, I've seen some discussions of that happening, uh, well being some of their calls, which is quite a nice approach. Some things are a little bit complex, maybe, but on the other end, it's very transparent and everybody knows where to contribute and they want to contribute or where other things have already been proposed by others. So it's it's a nice approach maybe to have a look at. Yeah, that sounds great. I think um, I'll speak for myself. I'd be accepting of any help from folks like that that can help us kind of uh, mature the process yeah. of, you know, getting, getting features on the table and how we do that. I, I think there's the communications and transparency is one aspect for sure and then there's kind of the other side of it which is like how do we actually implement and get it done yeah. and so you know the, we've been we've been so focused on the other side of the implementation and just fixing things and getting them stable uh we need to now bring the other half back up to the the same part so well we could try to reach out to the leads of for example something like superset and see if they want to give a presentation on their experience. They've gone through the whole incubator process of Apache and are now like a full project in Apache. So they follow all theirs, these rules that have been pushed upon them by Apache. So it might be an option. I'm, I can try to reach out to them and see if it's useful. Yeah, I think it would be useful to at least uh, understand Super what that chat. process looks like and things. So 
I don't know if anybody's seen the Atlas dashboards. I don't know if it's worth sharing that uh, on your screen, uh, Senna, yeah, like just pulling up. But um, they sound like that's. I just glanced through that uh, project you just sent out, uh, Peter, and it looks like they are using something similar to swim lanes and project boards, but not what we use it for is tracking issues for a given release. So we can show you what 2.8 looks like. Um, and uh, and what we can do is potentially set up like a roadmap project that that basically, again, getting back to that emphasis that you got to create a Git issue if we're going to track anything. Yeah. So um, if something wants to get on, we can create an issue that describes the new feature and enhancement that can be added to this roadmap project that we can actually make swim lanes for like which when we think that it can get delivered or what what phase we think it is when they talk about these um, committees that basically have stages like it's a stage one which is like an idea and stage three is like an implementation but not officially part of the platform and then like stage four is like complete um, we could certainly do something like that to facilitate some of the forward thinking development we yeah. Not and I know, this, uh, Chris, that that's also exactly what they do. So the individual GitHubs have their own issue tracker. So they, that, that stuff doesn't end up in the roadmap that's in their own. But the roadmap is a separate GitHub yes. where these like steps are being discussed, high-level thing. And we very recently start implementing this in Eden as well. So we have started with creating just a roadmap and have all the individual GitHubs with their own issues. Right. Just because I wanted to have the experience how it works. Um, but it, it's... I think it's quite nice, a uh, nice way of interacting, especially if the community is growing and we want to have more people involved. It's, uh, it's a nice way of uh, expanding to the usual suspects all the time. Yep. And, yeah, I think that's a fine idea. And I think there are different types of requirements that we need to be also be aware of the technical like tenants, right? The more of uh, yeah. uh, usability requirements. How do we make Atlas more usable, not changing features, but how do we make it more usable faster user friendly yeah. and then there are features right which would require users to to actually come back to us and say what are the features that are absolutely required by academic organizations or uh, I, I saw somebody from amgen pharmaceutical companies who are utilizing atlas healthcare organizations and that's where it gets a little tricky because they might might have different priorities for for different types of uh, features but equally important to collect all of this and then of course, yeah. the last but not the least, prioritizing all of this, allocating people and actually delivering and releasing, testing and releasing. Yeah. Right. And we, Pat, uh, Patrick and uh, Anthony, I, I think last year, we, in the year before, we were talking about essentially making Atlas eventually more modular, more uh, pluggable, right? <coughs> we called it at the time version 3, it was pre COVID times. Uh, so, so I don't know if anything uh, in terms of version has changed here, but I think that those are the, the ideas that we also entertain uh, internally. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, so the motivation there too is also uh, technical in nature, not so much features. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where a roadmap can help inform what does a, what does a version 3 look like versus how do we build version 3? I think those are right. kind of two different tasks. With two different skill sets so that's what i'm hoping that we can start to bring to the bring to bear with the work group so any other questions or comments observations procedures conditions <laughs> <laughs> Notes, etc. I can yeah. well, uh, things that are in the CDM domain model. There you um, go. <laughs> things that have changed in five point three. Uh, think. Uh. Yeah, I'd say I, I guess one of the things I mentioned earlier, but I'll, I'll maybe talk a little bit about it too. Is just having some uh, feature parity between what we're doing in Atlas and Hades. So I think one of the things that has kind of come to light, at least dawned on me in the last year or so, is that. It's, it's quite nice to be able to design, say, a prediction study in Atlas and to be able to run that either via Arachne or to download the package and be able to run that on the network. Same goes for estimation, but some of the characterization modules at this point are not constructed in a similar way. And so that's one thing that we want to 
or at least we've we've had discussions around bringing that sort of like feature parity to the characterization space so that when you design a pathways study or an incidence rate analysis and that sort of thing you can all you have the same options available for those as you do for prediction and estimation so that's that's going to give us the opportunity to work closer with the 84 group so that we have our packages that support what's coming into atlas and that sort of thing Apologies, I'm getting a lot of pop-ups from like the main community call as well as yep. the, <laughs> the, this this chat. So I, I'm I'm trying to keep an eye on both, but if I'm missing something, just feel free to raise your hand or jump in. Anthony, this is Paul again from Hopkins. Uh, one of the things I don't know if you've had discussions with uh, the Leaf group, but I, I kind of have. I use both tools. I use Leaf as a visual uh, cohort discovery tool for being able to browse my data sets and create some cohorts. It'd be really nice if there was some tighter integration between LEAF and visual interrogating of your concept sets with uh, Atlas. I don't know if you've uh, if you've had discussions with them. I, I can't say I have. I, I actually hadn't looked at that tool. I'm not sure if others have familiar familiarity with that. Not on my side. No. Is it that, open source? Uh, yes, that's going to be yeah. my next question. <laughs> yeah, it's an open source uh, out of the University of Washington. Um, uh, it's, it's certainly a, a very useful tool for training non SQL folks in how to build uh, SQL cohorts and, and add your features and add clinical conditions. And so, but what's nice about it as you're going, you can browse your ontologies and you're seeing how many data set, how much data you have there. And so it's a very, and you can search. Uh, so it has some overlap, but it's kind of like a fish finder where I kind of use Atlas for the, the deep sea fishing. Uh, but it helps me see the layout of my data very quickly. You have yeah. to give that a look. Also, nice analogy there with the fishing. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'll, I'll post some information about Leaf in the chat. OK, thank you. That was that was Arthur, right? Yes. Thank you, Arthur. And, and Paul, uh, I just realized you probably should have mentioned something to your question about deployments. There are great uh, architectural patterns and images that are available out of uh, uh, James Wiggins did it for Amazon. So you can read his white paper and uh, the pattern is the same as you would expect it to be just on all of the platforms like that. And also we've been working with Google, so the similar architecture pattern and even image published from from Google. So, you know, if you look at Amazon and Google as good examples that you can then uh, really apply on, on Azure side, Azure side as well. So they're, they're very similar in terms of deployment strategies. And are you doing any work with the Azure engineering teams? Yes. So we work with uh, two at least organizations today where we deploying OMAP, ETL and, and Atlas and Hades on Azure as a platform. So we can Excellent. We can talk about. Thanks, everyone. This is Arthur at Sinai. I, I, I need to get going. Good to Thank meet you. Thank you, Arthur. Nice to Thanks, meet you. Arthur. Yeah, any other uh, thoughts? Ideas? So, Anthony, right. anything big for Christian this year? Is, that we... Christian is talking, I think, but he is uh, muted. I get the feeling he may not be talking to us so specifically. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, I would so, love to have Christian's attention. It's it's fine, I suppose. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Greg. I, I no, can't. I was just saying one of the big topics that we'll probably at some point we'll come back to is like, what does it mean uh, Atlas changes in terms of version six or whatever the version is going to be of OMAP CDM support means? Uh, you know, this topic comes up all the time. So again, Claire has been doing a fantastic job in terms of maybe uh, creating a roadmap for OMAP. And again, this might not be version six, it might be actually ended up being version seven at the end, right? And then we've been discussing with Chris and, uh, and Anthony and Patrick separately in terms of what does it mean in terms of Atlas? Well, you know, would we plan it in version what we call three or maybe do an interim re release so that we can start supporting 
a newer version of CDM that actually introducing support for any new features and so on. So that that's one of the topics that keeps coming up that yeah. you need to watch out for for this year. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I have a quick thought on that, but it could open up a huge can of worms. But I'll just say, once upon a time, I wanted Cersei, for example, to support the notion that you can tell it what target CDM you want to apply the cohort definition to, and it would generate the appropriate SQL for that CDM. And do you know what I'm saying? So you could have Atlas pointing to different flavors of CDMs, like CDM versions, and based on which cohort definition you run against which source, it'll run it. And we added things to like validate that the parameters you put in your core definition are suitable for a certain version of the CDM, et cetera, et cetera. I'm kind of backing away from that now because now I realize that in order to make that work, all of our Odyssey packages are going to have to have CDM version aware modes. Um, and while it sounds like it's just put an if statement in the code, and if it is CDMv6, run this batch of code, if it's whatever, I don't think it's really that simple. And and we have to, everybody has to agree on how to define versions in the CDM. You know what I mean? Like you have to have the parsing of the version. I don't want to get into too much of the technical details. Point is, is that the simpler mode might be that if we get to version two or three of Hades and version three of Atlas or version four of Atlas Web API, whatever the version is, at a certain point we might want to say, like, as of this version, we support CDM v7. Like you got to like all this points to all the sources you point to is one version. Um, that's what we do with with v4 to v5. Atlas never supported v4, so it, like it was just v5. When v5 came out, Atlas was the tools on top of it, and that was the way it went. Since um, it hasn't been awesome for adoption of v6, right? But that is probably a lot of reasons. There's a, that's a multivariate, so let's not <laughs> think that it's just like one thing in Atlas that pro caused um, v6 adoption to stall. Um, but the point is, is that just to put it out there and maybe we can bring this up on the forums or in a broader, another working group community call about how we want to handle the new versions of CDMs. And if we are going to say, no, we should support multi versions within the same library, like we need help. Like people are going to have to get on board and, and realize like what level of work that actually is versus just saying this is the new standard now and just write our code to the standard. I really, just to the last thing I'll say, but I really wince at like all the additional testing that we'll have to do to make sure all the different versions of the CDM are are ac properly accounted for. It gives me a headache to think about what that is. Yeah, so. just to that point, Chris, it, it makes me wonder, given what Peter was saying earlier around like having the kind of Apache Linux, or Christian brought this up, like just all of these things can go into an incubator, right? Because they all need to kind of work you know, at the at the same level across the board. So if, if we have to make that decision, we make that as part of like early adoption. So if you want to be on V7, the tools can support that, and then we can make that decision around how to support backwards compatibility, right. you know, more yeah. broadly because it's a big it's a big decision. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, all right, just keep an eye on the time. We got about two more minutes. I think folks are starting to peel off of it. So, last call for questions. Otherwise, I think we'll probably end it here and thank everybody for joining. I guess we'll put or you will put a note on the forums about the official working group contact yeah, and joining absolutely. thing. If so everybody, my, ha, I'm so sorry, like it, this should be easily done if everybody has a Teams account and they've been using their Odyssey Teams credentials to do this, we could put it on a calendar. Um, but I suggest everybody try to get that if they can. Yeah, I, I'm embarrassed to say that it's just, it's just taking me a bit to get all of my Odyssey account stuff uh, done. <laughs> because <laughs> I keep screwing up my J and J stuff in the process. So that's just, that's my own. Those are my issues that I'll put on the table. So hopefully you will see that in the next week or so. Gotcha. Thanks, sir. All well, right. nice to see you, Christian. Have a good day. <laughs> uh, he's listening. Uh, was a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone for joining and for good discussion. Much appreciated. Nice to meet you, everybody. Have Bye. a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.